I genuinely feel like riding a bike is just a wonderful thing to incorporate into your life in general, not just because you want to get fit or you want to win a race, but in my mind, a bike is a means to liberation, independence, and education in that order. And I wanted to try and utilize my knowledge within an educational academic setting to try and allow people to learn on the bike in a similar way that you would learn in a classroom. Joining us in the studio today is an American cyclist who currently rides for the UCI Continental Team Legion of Los Angeles. He competed as a runner until college when he became a cyclist. He turned pro in 2019 and has competed in the Tour of Utah and the Tour of California. He's currently training to be a certified elementary school teacher. Please welcome Sam Boardman. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. I really appreciate it. It's so good to meet you and finally get this podcast scheduled. Where? Tell me, where are you in the world right now? I am currently in um, my home of residence in Whitefish, Montana, in the great snowy north of the country. We're about uh, 60 miles south of the Canadian border right now. And out our bedroom window or a little study window, I can see our local mountain and all the ski runs right now, which has got a lot of good snow coverage. But accordingly, it's also really cold out. So, Oh, yeah. Are you a big skier? You know, I... I wasn't at all. Actually, I'd never skied in my life before last year. But um, when my wife, who was born and raised here, and I, we moved here um, after she had bought property and we finished building a house in March of 2022, I decided I needed to learn how to ski because I thought I could do like the hard rider mentality of, oh, I'll just hit the trainer and just do mad hours in the base training period on the trainer and it'll be fine. But I mean, I don't care how mentally tough you are. That'll crack you at one yeah. point. And, I, and the reality is here, the infrastructure for winter sports is just so involved and expansive and accessible that it felt stupid not to try to get into something. So last year, I you know, invested in a pair of you know, touring skis. This year, I got a little more intense, got some Schemo skis, some like skinnier toothpick skis. And then I have a Nordic setup and I just really took time to learn the techniques and learn all of the ins and outs of the sport because it's just not only does it allow me to get outside and enjoy the actual outdoors during a time period when riding my bike is, you know, quote unquote doable, but really, really hard. But it's just also really good training. Granted, I still suck at Nordic skiing. I think that's one of those sports like swimming where unless you do it from a really young age, you just, the, the technical side of it is just going to be almost impossible to master as an adult. But I mean, it was great because it offered an opportunity as an adult, which I don't think you get a lot in doing something completely new, like yeah. totally new, totally out of your wheelhouse. You didn't mention snowboarding. So no snowboard in the quiver yet? No snowboarding. Actually, funny enough, my only experience on a chairlift or a mountain in terms of like winter sports had been snowboarding once uh, back east when I was a kid. Uh, when we went to, I believe it was uh, Liberty Ski Park in Maryland, or it might have been, it was either Whitetail or Liberty Ski Park, but just this like kind of really small, not that excellent, mostly man made snow you know, mid Atlantic ski, ski resort. Uh, and we were, <laughs> my friend and I, we went, I think we were on the slope for maybe 30 minutes before, like he slid out and then hit his <laughs> wrist. And I think he broke his wrist and we had to drive back. So we drove like three hours to go like snowboard for 30 minutes. And then oh, we had man. to go back. And that was my only experience before last year. Wow. Yeah. It was, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I still have good memories of that. I just feel bad because, you know, I was the one I think who encouraged him. We, oh, we should try snowboarding because, like, <laughs> I don't know why, but we were super into it. And then, you know, drug him out there and poor guy kind of cracked his wrist. And then that was that. It happens. It happens. Well, hey, Sam, let's let's rewind the tape about 27 or so years back to when you were born. Um <laughs> Tell us about where you were born and what you were into as a kid in terms of activities. 
So I was born in the amazing city of Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Um, I was raised there, too, all the way through high school before I left college. Um, and as a kid, I, funny enough, I loved riding my bike as a kid, but I didn't really discover bike riding or racing as, you know, a community, a culture, a sport until I was an adult. I just exclusively tooled around my neighborhood when I was younger, maybe, you know, fifth or sixth grade on my BMX bike, just kind of learning, you know, little tricks, obviously, you know, your classic neighborhood shenanigans with your friends, yeah, just yeah. building ramps in the backyard and hucking yourself off of it. And then, you know, opening up your shin when you slip on a pedal or something <laughs> like that, just your classic stuff. But then as I got older and, you know, I wanted to explore a little more, the bike actually was what allowed me to see the city. Um, I loved riding my bike downtown, you know, DC is a really amazing place as far as, you know, an urban enclave in the American East coast goes, because as a city, it's actually very easy to still be within the city, but not feel like you're being suffocated by, you know, a downtown densely populated, uh, environment that you would get, say in, you know, a New York city, a Philadelphia or Boston. It's actually a very, uh, you know, sparse city in terms of the concentration yeah. of the urban density. Um, but it was still awesome because I would go downtown and I'd ride my bike. I'd scoot around the monuments all the time. And it was just a great way to get to know my city in a really profoundly interactive way. Um, but then come high school, I realized like I was the only one of my friend groups from elementary school that was still like riding BMX bikes. And at that point I'm thinking I got to make some freaking friends. Like <laughs> there's, this is not sustainable for high school for me to just be tootling around by myself. Um, so I took up running. I, I don't even really know why, um, but I, I just wanted to try something different. And at that point I, in freshman year, I just wanted to try it and made a bunch of great friends and I just kept at it for four years and that's pretty much what I did. Wow. So I kind of transitioned from BMX riding to running and then that progressively went to cycling. But as a kid, it's funny, I specifically remember telling my friends I did not like organized sports. <laughs> that I, I thought that I quote unquote thought they were dumb. I, and I don't really know what it was. I think it was just like that classic teenage uh, like defiance in me thinking because all my friends were into football, soccer, baseball, whatever, basketball. I had no interest in any of that. I just did, I just wanted to ride my bike and enjoy riding my bike without the pressures of competition. The irony of that now is hilarious, but yeah, I, I that was pretty much my life. Well, tell me how do you how do you feel about organized ball sports today? Because you're still even though you're oh, in a competitive field, you're still um, you're still in an organized sport, but it's a little different than the average top four American sports. I still think being in, as part of an organized sport, you know, as part as my job, I think has really allowed me to see sport in general as much more than just the 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 game itself but the nuances within the game the politics within sports i love if there could have been a degree or something in college of sports politics i would have loved to study that because you know sports are politics in a lot of cases case in point you saw the coverage come out of the World Cup yeah. this past uh, November and December, and I was consuming that voraciously. And I think being in a sport as part of my like job and career, if you can call it that at this point, has shown me how interesting sports can be in general. So it's funny, I've gotten more interested in ball sports or other sports, be it you know basketball, baseball, football, the big three in America. And I watch all these sports documentaries and it's just amazing how a good filmmaker or storyteller can create something so compelling out of a sport like curling. For example, I watched yeah. this documentary on Netflix called losers. And there was a episode about uh, this curling team that basically changed the nature of the game such that there had to be rules adapted to it. And they managed to take curling and make it feel like I was watching the last dance talking about, you know, the bulls in 1996 or something like that. It was, wow. and 
I think just as a person who's operating in sports, I, I have the knowledge of sports politicking to understand how difficult that can be, you know, for a team to do that. And, you know, and that extends to everything now. Yeah. So I love watching sports. It's hilarious now. I love watching sports of any kind. That's funny. Sam, tell me about your parents growing up. What did your parents do? My mom, uh, she worked as, or works still, as um, a labor lawyer, um, mainly representing uh, plumbers and pipe fitters throughout the country. Um, and my dad, he worked as the executive treasury um, or treasurer and secretary of a local labor union in Washington, D.C. that mainly worked with uh, hotel workers, but also worked with restaurant workers as well. So labor law was the industry of of the family. Wow. Wow. Any brothers or sisters? I have one older sister. Um, She studied photography um, and currently lives in New York City right now. She actually works for uh, Harry's, the razor company. She works in their uh, creative, creative department. So she's the one who's organizing all the photo shoots and the campaigns that they're doing. That's a cool little brand. Yeah. They make great razors. I use them on my legs. <laughs> Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> not your, but not your face. Not, not my face as much. The, the most of the action is seen on my legs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More of a beard trimmer for your face, yeah. right? Yeah, you, exactly. you, you, you usually rock a full beard, don't you? Well, it's, it's funny. I, not until recently because I only really learned that I could grow a beard last year. And it's really funny because it fits exactly in the timeline that my dad set forth for me when I was something like 18, when I had friends who were just already grown men who could grow full beards, mustaches. And I asked my dad, dad, when, when were you able to grow a beard? And he said, not till I was 27. So funny. You've got some time. And hilariously, literally, as I was turning 27 was when I figured out I could actually like the facial hair on my cheeks could <laughs> finally fill in to the point that I could call it a beard. And that's, that's, you know, liberal at best, maybe a bit of an embellishment, but. Yeah. But you know, now you've got that, that Hollywood beard style, right? Where it's not super full and rich. Like you, you've got the beard style right now that people pay so much money to figure out how to do. You just have it naturally due to your age. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Are your parents still in the DC area? My parents, yeah, they both live uh, in DC now. My dad actually retired in June of 2022, so he's very recently um, finished up work. My mom has still got a couple of years, but um, my wife and I we were just there actually a couple of days ago visiting in DC, kind of enjoying the the mid-atlantic december which in more and more these days is you know becoming warmer it's funny as the bomb cyclone that recently dropped that big old like palm slap that kind of made its way across the country yeah. made its way to the east coast it was actually colder in dc than it was here in montana um but then as it the system progressed it was in the 60s and i hadn't felt temperatures above freezing and like two months and it felt so good. I rode outside without gloves. Amazing. So lucky. Amazing. Breathe between, you know, breeze between my fingers. That's not (laughs) produced by a fan. And Sam, tell me your wife is also an athlete, right? Correct. Um, Jess, Sarah, she, she was a professional road cyclist for almost 10 years um, before transitioning to uh, gravel cycling a couple years ago. Um, And she's progressively, started to take steps back from the competitive side and working um, mostly within the community development side. Um, So she herself created uh, a, a, or an energy bar company called JoJ Bar um, that was uh, acquired by a holdings company within the last couple of years. And she now works uh, for that holding company within uh, the JoJ brand as, you know, the community development liaison as well as a product developer. So she's the one who's at a lot of these events, you know, boots on the ground, uh, interacting with uh, athletes and uh, prospective, you know, buyers, sellers. And she's the one who's basically trying to build the brand and the community relationship therein. Cool. Um, 
yeah, so she's she's done a lot of work um, in that regard. And I think that's pretty much she's carved out that niche for herself within the sport as she's taken a step back from actually racing. Yeah, it is super fun. Well, let's let's switch to a sprint round where I throw a bunch of this or that's at you just to see sort of our, our SRAM style of psych profile. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Pancakes or waffles? Oh, pancakes. Anybody who knows me, I go pancakes. Beer or wine? Uh, neither, actually. All I'll right. just do water. <laughs> That's very simple. How about, an- is there another beverage, though? Let's say you're out and about and, you know, water's already on the table. I- what would you order? If it was after a race, for example, I guess, you know, after a hard race, a milkshake, I, it, you know, you can hardly call it a beverage, but I love a milkshake. Yeah. But I do Orange Fanta is... I don't know if it's because I'm a cyclist that I like Orange Fanta or what, but there's something about sipping on a cold <laughs> Orange Fanta after a bike ride that is just, mwah, it's mint. That's awesome. All right, coffee or tea? Tea. Tacos or burritos? Burritos, more bang for your buck. <laughs> Spicy or mild? Ah, uh, Sadly, I'm mild. I'm soft. <laughs> uh, cold weather or hot weather? You know, I think I would go with, I think I'm going to go with hot weather. I think cold weather, generally, I prefer because you can do a little more to accommodate yourself. But I genu- I actually think I do better in the heat, funny enough. Growing up yeah. in the mid-Atlantic, anybody who knows those East Coast summers, it's it's heat you can see when you walk out the door. Oh, my. Oh, my. I know what you're talking about in Chicago. Yeah, you know, you know that humidity. Yeah. How about rain or snow? Snow. Absolutely snow. <laughs> The mountains or the beach? The mountains. Big cities or quiet suburbs? Quiet suburbs. Cars or trucks? Motorcycles. Nice. I, you know what? I, I need to make a note. I need to add that. <laughs> uh, pavement or dirt? My heart still lies with pavement right now. Gloves or gloveless? No gloves. Clipped in or flat pedals? Clipped in. Low pressure in your tires or high pressure in your tires? I am, I am becoming more and more a low pressure evangelist. So I'm going to say low pressures. Isn't that great? Uh, fix it yourself or take it to a mechanic? Fix it yourself. Largely because you probably broke it yourself. So I think you should be responsible. <laughs> yeah, if you crashed, you got to fix it. Yeah, exactly. Last one, dogs or cats? Dogs. All right, Sam, so you eventually go out west to California and you go to school and you're a runner, but you discover the bike. Tell us about the progression then from sort of collegiate cycling into what would have been like your first race opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the collegiate scene, I think, was great because it offered a perfect introduction to someone who had no idea what bracing bikes was about um, because it's very, it's very low key, but it can be as competitive as you want it to be. Um, and as an individual, I realized how much I loved racing my bike and I wanted it to be competitive and I could make it competitive. But moreover, it just offered me an opportunity to make a lot of friends from a lot of different universities, pretty much up and down the coast of California. And it allowed me to travel, see different places, which, At its core, I think that is what cycling is about, is if anything, it's the most educational sport in the world, I would argue. And I think a lot of people argue because you, your venue is the world, you know, it's kind of, it sounds like a, you know, trite thing to say, but you compete on roads within certain regions, which offers you uh, an opportunity to see a bunch of places. So that's what collegiate cycling offered me in a very I think microcosmic way, considering that we were really only competing, you know, within California, but it allowed me to see that cycling could take me to all these different places. Um, So come my sophomore year, I had been speaking with a friend of mine at uh, UCLA where I was going to school who had gone to Belgium one summer. He had kind of organized his own solo trip to this place called the farm. Um, And I think if you're familiar with the the workings of international all comers cycling in Belgium, people are going to be familiar with this farm. It's this little uh, 
uh, you know, <laughs> compound, I guess you could call it, just outside of Ghent, run by this guy who, as an Anglophone, his name is kind of funny. It's Staff Bone. Is how you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he runs this club called Kings North International Wheelers. And my friend had gone there to race um, just the local Kermes scene within and around Ghent, Udenarda, that West Flanders region. And he had told me all these stories. And as I'm coming to understand cycling, I realized like, oh man, Belgium's Mecca. That's where you want to be. Yeah. And so after my second year of cycling, um, you know, and racing most of the collegiate scene, I wanted really desperately to try and get over to Europe and experience that. So I organized my own trip to Belgium for summer of 2016. And, um, I, you know, got a plane ticket, packed my bike, and kind of went blindly over there. And I arrived at this place called The Farm, and I knocked on the door, and a random woman opened the door, and she said, who are you? And I said, I'm one of the cyclists here. And she said, okay, let's see if we can find you a room. And she brought me into this house, which I only learned at the end of my tenure there was actually a renovated chicken coop, which explained why it was so disgusting. (laughs) But, you know, over that couple of month period that I was living there. I mean, truly it is one of the best periods of my life in the sport because it was just, it was nothing but education from, you know, the cycling racing standpoint, a cultural standpoint and, you know, cultural exchange because I had roommates from Lithuania, the Ukraine, India, uh, South Africa, Australia, um, England, who I was able to speak with and learn from during my time there. And it kind of solidified my goal that I wanted to try and do this professionally, just because I realized like, this is just a really cool sport. And it's, you know, already bringing me to a bunch of really cool places. So I go from Belgium, I then spent um, a semester studying in Spain. And then I came back to um, the States and, and, and resume study in the States in 2017. And at that point, I had joined um, an amateur team, which at that point was, um, known as Herbalife 24 PB Nature's Bakery, but it's now known as uh, the Filet Factory Racing Team, um, based out of, run by one Phil Mooney, who's a great guy, um, based out of San Rafael, California, and NorCal. And that was the team that gave me an introduction, not only to the national, um, I guess what was then known as the Pro Road Calendar um, in the US, but also offered me a couple opportunities at racing internationally. So that first year in 2017, I just went all in, you know, wherever I could race, whenever I could race, I was doing it. And I was cutting my teeth in in the local scene, mostly in NorCal, doing a lot of those local races up there because, you know, pre COVID, the local racing scene there is, it was excellent. I mean, the road races there, they're hard, they're dynamic. The scene was pretty good. And it was just, it was an amazing way once again, to learn about, you know, how to race, what to do to race, but also see a lot of California. And then I transitioned to doing races like Redlands. And then that summer in 2017, I kind of, my coach and I decided it would be a, like a, an experimental summer of trying to bite off as much as I can chew. So I spent six weeks on the road. And in that six weeks, I did North Star Grand Prix. May it rest in peace. That race was amazing. Um, I went from North Star to uh, Dairy Lands to U23 Nats in Louisville, back to California to do the 4th of July crit in Davis, California. Then we drove up to Vancouver to do BC Super Week, and then we finished off the block at Cascade. So in that six-week period, I think I didn't race a collective, I think like 11 days or something like that, but then literally every other day I was racing. And I exited that period a shell of a human but (laughs) i got to experience so much and then at the end of that summer was my first international trip where we raced in china and again it was just incredible because i got to see that fast forward to 2018 similar schedule of just trying to race as much locally a couple international events including the tour de rwanda um, in july which was the big peak race for us which was once again incredible And then at the end of 2018, after I'd graduated from school, I knew I wanted to continue the sport professionally. I just didn't really know where to go from there. And so I just started doing the thing where you pitch resumes left and right, trying to figure out 
if there are opportunities. And finally, um, I was contacted by um, Danny Van Hout of Wildlife Generation, with whom I signed my first pro contract. And that's where, you know, that kind of launched launched the, the trajectory into, into the professional ranks. Sam, what did you study at UCLA? I studied reading. I was an English and uh, Spanish major. Rather, the, jo- the joke I always say is I majored in cycling and minored in school. <laughs> yeah, you, you pretty much rode all throughout school, right? Yeah. I mean, come after that summer in Belgium, I had decided basically I was going to try and make a living in the sport. And I didn't really know what that meant at the time. But it, what, I, what it meant relative to school was I was basically building a schedule around my training. You know, and luckily working in the humanities, it was actually fairly easy to try and, you know, mold my schedule into something that would accommodate, you know, pretty bulky training hours because that's how I like to train. And I knew my time in Los Angeles was limited and we have access to the Santa Monica mountains. And I wanted to take as much advantage of that as possible during the four years I was at school. So that's, that's what I was doing. It's a cool place. Had you not gotten so into cycling what would you have done or what could you have done with your degree i think i had always known um that i wanted to go into teaching um part of me didn't really know what kind of teaching i think uh i had thought about pursuing you know post um secondary or excuse me post um collegiate uh post-grad degrees in English. But then one day, I remember this so clearly, a professor came in and she was looking really frazzled. And she was a grad sc- student working as an adjunct. And she basically said, all right, everybody raise your hands if you want to pursue English post-grad. A couple people raised their hands in the class. She said, okay, <laughs> don't do that. Like, I'm here to tell you, do not do it. It will ruin your life. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to scrap that plan. Wow. Um, and she basically said, look, it's like, Working in academia within English is such a hard thing because the professorships are usually held on until people literally die. Right. And so the job market is so limited. Then she's just said, you're going to go into debt. It's a niche profession. It's going to be hard to find a job. You should try and pursue something else. And so I always thought, you know, okay, what do I want to do? I And I remember in high school, I've had such an impactful relationship with a teacher of mine who taught me the value in trying to work hard, not for the sake of impressing someone else, but because it felt good to actually produce a piece of work that you felt proud of. Yeah. Um, and it kind of showed me, okay, like, you know, teaching is a noble profession. I've always thought that I have a bunch of educators in my family. And as I had come to learn post-grad, when I started working as a substitute teacher to try and make extra money, while I wasn't in the racing season, I actually just loved teaching. I loved working with kids. Um, and, you know, I decided to pursue that full time with my master's degree right now in elementary education. But I think in the long term, I actually probably would have pursued something in special education. I really love special education. And the like the long term positions that I've had in special education classrooms have been some of the most impactful in my journey as an educator. And I think that's where I would have probably ended up. Well, and you kind of are headed that way too, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of halfway there. And at one point, I was thinking maybe okay, with a Spanish degree, I'd go teach English, you know, in South America, Latin America, or something like that, use it as an excuse to go travel. But, you know, You've got a, you've got a lot of different roads you can go down. Yeah. Let's 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 we're going to get there in a little bit, but let's stay on your cycling trajectory. So, eventually, you get a call from Legion. Tell us about that call and that transition. So, come uh, it was around fall of 2020. I realized um, uh, I wasn't going to get a contract renewal from Wildlife Generation, and so I was thinking, okay, what do I want to do? And this was during the uh, burgeoning uh, gravel cycling marketplace. And I thought, okay, I could try and go into gravel. I didn't really know what that meant. But again, as I said earlier, my heart still lies on the pavement. I don't know yeah. why. I It's just something I think about the raw speed and the kind of just competitive nature of it. 
because at the time gravel was still in the transitional phase to what I think it is now where we're getting, I mean, I'm sure you saw the articles come out recently, no more aero bars, you know, the mass start events are going to be separated into the elite categories. Like the professionalization of gravel is, is happening now, but it was still, it was still, you know, kind of in the more rugged crunchy granola era back in 2020. (laughs) But, and I, and I wanted to try and pursue road cycling as much as I could. And I had, met Justin and Corey back in 2014 when I had first moved to LA and I was doing some of the local group rides like the peer ride or the now ride, which anyone who is uh, familiar with the local cycling scene within, you know, Santa Monica or South Bay area, that's, I mean, those are like big rides that everyone legendary. loves doing. Yeah. Yeah. Legendary rides. Um, I bumped in them, made some small chat, became friendly with them as the years went on. And, you know, it's that classic cycling relationship where you become friends with somebody purely by virtue of the fact that you just end up seeing them every weekend because you're all at the same races. So you have these passing relationships with them. And eventually I reached out to Justin and Corey in 2020 and I asked, you know, hey, I I really, I believe in the mission of the team. Um, I believe that what you are doing is worthwhile and I would love to contribute to the program if you think that there is a space for me there. And uh, it was kind of a period of waiting, seeing if there would be an opportunity. Then October of 2020, they called me and said, hey, uh, spots open up on the team. Do you want to still join us? And I said, yeah. And that was pretty much what, you know, catapulted me into the program. And here we are. We're still here. That is super, super awesome. Um, what a what a fun trajectory Legion itself has had, expanding from you know one team to now you know multiple teams. The you know the, the crit event in Sacramento, uh, the Lions Den, and uh, you know ultimately you know the future the future of of what could become you know American crit racing, right? Mm-hmm. We certainly hope so. Will you still mix gravel and road together or? I think part part of me wants to do that. Um, I think the reality of racing in America um, is just the road racing, long form road racing is just, it doesn't exist like it used to. You know, like I was saying, you had races like Cascade and North Star, which offered a large, a uh, chunk of the American stage racing scene, pretty good opportunities to race those kinds of races, but they just don't exist anymore. And so I've done a couple gravel races now, not a lot, but a couple, and I've enjoyed every one that I've done. Um, do I wish they were just a little bit shorter? Do I want to be mm-hmm. racing like more than 150 miles? Generally, no, but it's yeah. still like, it's still a really good challenge. And I think that's at the end of the day, that's what's really fun about riding a bike is there is that inherent challenge about simply like finishing the event yeah. to some degree. Um, so I think I would like to tr- try and inter- intermix gravel and road cycling in whatever way I can, you know, if the schedule allows it. But at the end of the day, I still just like, I like racing on the road and I, I like not having to clean my bike after every single ride. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sam, to date, what's been your biggest highlight or accomplishment that you're most proud of on the bike? On the bike, I think it was um, my win in the Joe Martin uh, TT uh, last year in Devil's Den. It was just a very special moment, not least of which the fact that I had one, which is just a really rare occurrence for me. It doesn't happen all that much, but kind of the circumstances in which it happened there, there's a video of it, um, of me like finding out because unlike a road race or a traditional race where it's just whoever crosses the line first wins and you kind of know if you've won, you finish a time trial and unless someone tells you like right there and then you've won, you don't really know. And so I crossed the line, uh, at the top of the, of the climb and it's a hill climb. Basically it's a hill climb time trial. It's kind of a stair steppy, um, hill climb in this little state park in Arkansas. I crossed the line. I hadn't been looking at my computer at all. I had no idea what the power output was, what the time was because I had gone into it just thinking, okay, just go hard. It's a less than 10 minute effort. Like you either have it or you don't. So it's like, 
I went and I crossed it. And it was funny because I crossed the line actually thinking like, shoot, I feel like I could have given more on that. I'm kind of bummed. And I'm already thinking in my head, you know, there are people who probably went faster than I did. And I, I, I thought to myself, okay, I, I, you know, I think I could have done well. I then roll back. Um, I flip a Yui. I roll back. Um, and it was pissing rain at that point. And the funny thing was, I think it took me as long to go down the hill because of yeah. the switchbacks and the rain as it did to take me to go up. I got back to the team area. I changed like full, like I did all of this. I changed out of my clothes and I'm sitting there with my team and we're all just kind of chatting, waiting for results to come by. And then uh, I think it was Brendan Rim from Wildlife. He comes over and he kind of sticks his hand to shake mine. He's like, hey, dude, great job. I was like, for what? <laughs> like, I think you won. <laughs> and I, I, I feel bad for Brendan because I got like super stern with him. I'm like, Brendan, if you're joking, I'm going to be really angry with you <laughs> right now. He's like, yeah, no, no, totally. no. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you won. And I was like, oh man. And I like, I started like hyperventilating a little bit. Heart was beating kind of fast. And eventually Tyler Williams was just like, okay, let's go and ask somebody. Cause I was like pacing a trench in front of the car. Cause I was waiting <laughs> for someone to find me. So we go over to a UCI official or someone who looked like official. I don't really know. I don't, I wasn't really thinking too straight. It was someone with a clipboard. And I asked him like, Hey, do you know who won? And they say, no, <laughs> I don't. You're going to have to ask someone else. And then uh, another person from another team, they just said, you won, Sam. I was like, are you serious? And he said, yeah, it's official. And then I just freaked out. Dude, that's amazing. Uh, on, the, on the polar opposite side, what has been one of the scariest moments in cycling in your professional career so far? The scariest moment? Um... Or maybe you haven't had one yet. I haven't had like scary moments in terms of, I don't know. There, I'm trying to think if there was a scary moment in particular where I felt like I was about to crash or something. Well, I'll tell you what, tour California, this was, and this was again, pre pandemic before this whole uh, transition to this massively aggressive race style that we're seeing today in the world tour happened it was still really freaking hard. Like, yeah. And every day was the hardest day of my life over and over and over again. And I remember uh, going down Mount Hamilton uh, on one of the stages that actually ended at Morgan Hill. Um, and I was already properly dropped at this point, but everyone is still <laughs> racing, you know, full gas, trying to just make sure they make time cut. And I'm going down a descent, and this is when there was still kind of mixed braking systems within the Peloton. So I was on rim brakes, and the Gruppetto I was in, most everybody was on disc brakes. So they had kind of better disc brakes than I did, and they had just repaved the surface of Mount Hamilton, and which meant that it was almost worse because the old pavement, which was super bombed out and crappy, actually forced you to go slower more yeah. but now the new road was essentially like racing on a racetrack like the tarmac was so grippy so everyone had all this false confidence going through these turns and hamilton has a bunch of decreasing radius turns that if you don't know they're coming which i didn't you're you're just sending yourself over the edge into the shadow realm because you're not able to scrub speed fast enough so i do remember that being an ex like a pretty astonishingly puckering moment for lack of a better term um <laughs> going down that knowing okay i'm trying to make time cut because i want to finish this race i also don't want to die so let's like let's try and find a balance here yeah i remember that very specifically actually that was really terrifying yeah those moments can be that's 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 gnarly yeah um changing gears a little bit to uh to fitness and nutrition and routine Tell, tell us about like just your, your normal fitness nutrition routine. What do you do on the daily to, to maintain your base? And are there any nutrition, you know, things that you've got to do? Uh, I mean, not really. I would actually say the, I don't, I don't follow any kind of strict diet. I, I mean, oftentimes I'm eating like chicken nuggets, like the store-bought chicken nuggets that you get at Costco for dinner yeah. combined with a yeah. salad or something just for sake of convenience. <laughs> Other than that, I'm not following any kind of strict nutrition regimen. Uh, 
the only thing that I would say that I have been trying to be a lot better about um, this year um, and during this off season is trying to cultivate better recovery habits. So I, I know that I have like a horrible habit of every time I come back from a ride or a training session, the moment I walk into the door, I kind of just sit down and I'm on my phone and I'm just sitting in, you know, my dirty clothes, my sweaty clothes. And I just have learned you need to get off your phone. You need to <laughs> change out of your clothes, like chamois time, the, the old adage, the chamois time is not training time. Like get out of your freaking chamois, like spend as little time in those as possible um, and then make sure you eat something immediately after the training. Don't squander the recovery window. Right. Um, and then the main things have been just like foam rolling and uh, using uh, recovery tools like um, massage guns. I, I have to say like a massage gun is one of the best things that I've ever been able to have access to because I genuinely feel like it just makes me better. And so literally trying to do that every single day helps with the recovery and just makes my legs feel like they're just not completely torched every single session. And that's, that's it. I don't, I don't, I don't really subscribe to like zeroing in on a diet because I've had like issues with eating in the past. And I don't, I don't like trying to, you know, monitor my diet other than just if I'm hungry, I eat. And that's the extent of it. How about any gym fitness? Do you do any, anything other than ride your bike? Okay. I used to be horrible about that. I used to only ever ride my bike and I hated going to the gym, but this, this season specifically, I actually have gotten way better about doing concerted gym work. Um, I think that might be largely motivated by the fact that I live in a place where it is gray and snowy and I'm not actually yeah. you know, going anywhere. And you know, when I do ride my bike, it's on the trainer. And so the gym actually is my quote unquote going somewhere. And so it's the escape from, from just being in the house, staring at a screen. And that has actually been huge for me because I feel like I just neglect so much in terms of, you know, recovery and just injury prevention largely when I don't go to the gym and having, had a concerted base building block throughout this entire off season, I can feel it paying dividends now because I'm just, I'm not as sore after riding yeah. anymore. Yeah. Not to say yeah. that I was just obliterated, but still there, I cannot encourage people enough to try and supplement their bike riding with some kind of other exercise because riding a bike exclusively, it, prepares your body for literally nothing else but riding a bike like i don't know i'm sure you understand it's like stairs still wind me i don't like i don't like lifting things you know so well it's and there, just, there is there is proven science too that'll tell you that core and upper body work will make you stronger on the bike you can yeah. output more power if you have more core and upper body strength holding onto the bike allowing you to push down on the pedals harder um, yeah is a benefit or a byproduct of that upper body work. No, it, completely. Like there's just a lot of stuff that I think I was very guilty of neglecting because I just thought, okay, all you got to do to get better at riding a bike is just ride your bike. But there's, yeah. you know, there's so much more that can be done. And I genuinely think too, along with the physical side of things, mentally, I can see it as being a huge benefit for athletes to have the segmentation in their training and the change of pace within their training to offer their body and their mind something else to do other than just pedal yeah. in circles. Uh, Sam, we are closing up on the last section of our show, which we call the cool down, but it's really the most exciting portion of the show where we talk about how pros like yourself are using, you know, their position in the spotlight to do great things in the world. And you've got a couple really exciting things that you're doing. You know, we started off by talking about you being an educator. And so I know you're, you're just about wrapping up the training for that. Tell me about that and, and you know, what you hope to do with that, that, that certificate. Um, well, that it, it was largely motivated by wanting just something in the back pocket for when racing was over. Um, the reality is in the current marketplace of cycling, 27 is like 500 in cycling years. Um, so it, it's hard not to feel like I'm getting old, even when I'm, I feel young, but I know that my time as a competitive racer is limited. And so I wanted to have something to 
look forward to after racing. But largely, I wanted to apply my time in education to my time in cycling. I feel like the two aren't mutually exclusive. And that was largely tied into my work with Legion in developing the junior day camp initiatives that we started um, in this year, or excuse me, in 2022, um, where we were trying to offer young riders access to the team and athletes and resources that we have that can help guide them in the sport, be it through a competitive lens or just through a recreational lens, because I genuinely feel like riding a bike is just a wonderful thing to incorporate into your life in general, not just because you want to get fit or you want to win a race. But in my mind, and the people have heard me say this a lot, I genuinely believe that a bike is a means to liberation, independence, and education in that order. And I wanted to try and utilize my knowledge within an educational academic setting to try and allow people to learn on the bike in a similar way that you would learn in a classroom. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Do you see yourself at some point being a full-time, you know, elementary school teacher? Yeah, I I genuinely do. Um, Once the competitive side of everything I want to try is done, and I'm looking just to stay put and be home, uh, then yeah, I think I'm going to end up in an elementary school position. Most likely I'll try and figure out a way to incorporate bike riding into that in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Have you been practicing your, your chalkboard, Mr. Boardman, you know, script? Uh, See, it's still so hard for me to go by Mr. Boardman, partly because I was doing my student teaching in a kindergarten classroom and Boardman is actually a pretty hard word for kindergartners to pronounce. Oh, really? There's a lot going on. Yeah. They were having trouble with it. So I just ended up being Mr. B, which I like. It's kind of, you know, cute yeah, that's and good. playful. And Mr. B- Mr. Boardman is my father. As, like, that's as funny. Are you, are you a key, are you a key and peel fan? I'm a huge key and peel fan. You know, that, that, the one classroom skit where, <laughs> where they play on the last names and the first names and mush them all together. I love that skit. That's a great one. Um, you've got one other really cool program that I want, I want you to share more about, and that's the, the last best ride. Tell me mm-hmm. about that. So the last best ride um, is the brainchild of my wife, Jess. Um, she herself was the recipient and beneficiary of uh, many community funded local scholarships that helped her pursue a college degree. And she always had a vision to recreate a similar program when she returned home. And after we moved back here, she wanted to create a gravel cycling event, not only because she felt the region itself offered pretty amazing gravel riding that she wanted other people within the community to enjoy, but she wanted to use the event as a vehicle to fundraise, to fundraise for what she ended up developing and calling uh, the champion scholarship award program, um, which she created alongside various counselors and educators from high schools within the local Flathead Valley region. Um, So, the whole purpose of the program is to utilize uh, proceeds from the race as well as supplementary donations to uh, give financial aid to financially qualified young women in the Valley who are pursuing post-secondary education. Um, And so the, the goal here was just to motivate people to come to Whitefish, not only because we wanted them to see what this place had to offer, but tell them that simply by, registering for the event, you are helping make someone's life better. And this past year, we were able to give out almost $40,000 worth of scholarships to several uh, recipients who are currently pursuing post-secondary education, where they otherwise would have had to compromise their academic goals because of financial restrictions. Amazing. Amazing. Congrats. What a cool, cool organization. No, you you do that together with your wife, right? Yeah. Registration is still open if people want to register right now. Um, so if they just go Google the last best ride um, in Whitefish, Montana, and they sign up, proceeds from their registration will go directly towards funding the Champion Scholarship Award. So I encourage anybody who is curious about Northwest Montana, if you haven't been here, 
definitely check it out. The gravel riding is insane. And I guarantee you the views will leave you stunned. Awesome. Awesome. We, we will also put all that information in the show notes. Awesome. So you can follow along there. Sam, we are just about out of time. It's been awesome talking to you and hearing your story and, and seeing your, your progress and your progression. And uh, thanks for doing everything that you do. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate everything that you and everybody else at SRAM does for us individually as athletes, but also supporting Legion um, and our endeavors. We wouldn't be the team we are without you guys. So thank you all. Well, you are very, very welcome. And on behalf of everyone at SRAM, uh, we thank you as well. Have an awesome day and uh, we will catch you soon at a race. I hope so. See ya. Cheers, Sam. <laughs>